Let's take it back all the way to the top. Julian Carmona and Brent Gann came on the radio show to talk about the boycott divestment sanction movement and how it's impacting us here at, uh, at the UC schools and how perhaps it shouldn't impact us. The issue of whether the union should even be discussing this is, is also part of our interview. It's broken up into two parts. We're going to lead off with the merits of the movement in general, and then we'll talk about what were to happen if the vote on December 4 regarding the BDS movement and the union support of that, what happens if it actually goes through? And there's a very good chance that it will. So without further ado, Julian and Brent on Conrad's Corner. Hey, everybody. This is Conrad Wilton alongside Julian Carmona and Brent Gann, two UC Davis graduate accounting students here to share their perspective on the merits of the boycott divestment movement against Israel and whether the UC Student Worker Union should be making it a top priority. All UC graduate students and student workers who are members of UAW 2865, which is the University of California Student Worker Union, will vote on December 4th whether to join the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement. 83 elected officers overseeing the union decided to put forth this proposal, and Julian and Brent are here to share their views as to what admittedly is a very volatile and explosive topic i'm surprised that uh, you guys came on down here but uh, you got your hard hats ready and uh, i guess we're, we're good to go yeah. so yeah. first off for those seeking the other side of the story the folks who are supporting the bds movement they're everywhere online including an open letter on the union's website to the uc community titled student workers at the uc support palestine all you have to do is google uaw 2865 BDS movement, and it's the top hit. It talks about the the airstrikes in Gaza, it talks about Amnesty International and the UN's determination that Israel likely committed war crimes. It condemns the seven-year siege that, uh, in their words, Israel had has launched against Gaza, sealing the borders and creating one of the world's largest open-air prisons, and you get the point. It goes on and on and on and on. Uh, but I want to get your view on the BDS movement. Do these human rights allegations against Israel hold water? So the BDS movement as a whole is just filled with disinformation. The human rights allegations, I don't believe they hold any water. Um, Israel's main goal in this recent conflict this past summer was to flush out Hamas from Gaza. The goal is not to terrorize the Palestinian people. And the allegations that the US, or that Israel is intentionally attacking the Palestinian people and occupying Gaza is just a complete lie. Right, right. I, I, I completely agree with Brent on this one. Um, I think one of the goals there was attempting to, one, demilitarize uh, Hamas. They talked about that, or demilitarize the Gaza Strip. And they were talking about that because Hamas was sort of the source of a lot of these rockets, obviously, and the source of these tunnels, which um, was also another goal of theirs to uh, stop the incursion of Hamas fighters into Israel itself by destroying the tunnels. And so these sort of Human rights violations, I think, ignore the both the the other side of it as well. Um, that um, Hamas essentially rules Gaza is also doing uh, human rights violations by using their citizens of human, as human shields, placing mortars and rockets in um, mosques and uh, hospitals and things like that. But what you see on the news, unfortunately, is um, uh, very one-sided. That uh, they blame Israel for most of what happens, when in fact uh, it is. Uh, Hamas's fault in that sense. Why do you think that's the case, where you have such clear-cut evidence of of Hamas, for example, as you said, placing rockets in in schools and in mosques and in places where there are lots of civilians and women and children? And why why the focus against Israel? Where is this coming from? Why is it so one-sided in your view? I think um, to a certain extent on campus, um, there was a lot of this uh, belief that the Palestinian people are this sort of underdog in this case, that, that Israel is like this this mean, oppressive government, when in fact they're not really doing an inward uh, look, what I, what I would call an inward look on the Palestinian people, in that um, Palestine, the area, at least the Gaza Strip, is kind of the way it is because of failed governments there. And if they really wanted a functional two-state solution, they have to have an independent functioning country that can hold its own, that can police itself. And that's something that I think the Gaza Strip and uh, to a certain extent the West Bank um, cannot do because of Hamas and uh, because of the sort of favorable image Hamas has. And I think there's a lot of organizations that will sort of take that uh, for, what it's, for, for what it's worth. It's saying that Hamas is, uh, is not a terrorist organization when in fact it is. 
they think, well, Palestinian people are sort of just this oppressed group. Well, does, does the BDS movement call for a peaceful two-state solution? Doesn't everybody want harmony? BDS does not call for a two-state solution in any form. The tenets of BDS are boycott, divestment, and sanctions from Israel in all forms. So if BDS gets their ultimate wish, I guess you can call it, then there is no Israel. Um, there's an Arab state to take its place. There's just no room for a two-state solution if BDS were to become successful and if it were to hold any real water. So you would say the goal is to eliminate Israel to bring it down? Yeah, I would. I think I think based on what we had we had uh, looked at today, the video that um, some people are very openly about bringing Israel down, and they even said in it that it would be good for the world to bring Israel down. That was something that came out of someone who is a supporter of BDS. And that um, video was from and that video was from BDS in Berkeley, I think the Berkeley chapter, and there they was invited a, some speakers. Yeah, there was a panel discussion hosted by the BDS Caucus, which is the main organization trying to push BDS through the grad student union. And the BDS caucus happens to have several members of the UAW leadership on it. So they held an independent event put on by leaders of the UAW where they, they hosted three um, extremely pro-BDS anti-Israeli speakers. Do, do you find it ironic that of all the atrocities that have been unleashed in the Middle East, Syria, for example, being most recent, and around the globe, like North Korea, Sudan, you can even argue China and the limited freedom that their citizens have. Why, if we're going to call out a country to boycott, divest, and sanction, why are we doing so against Israel? Do you think it's it's a proxy for anti-Semitism? Do you think that Israel is just an easy target because it's so politically disfavored in liberal circles? Yeah. So this is a touchy subject. I tend to think that BDS is not so much a proxy for anti-Semitism, but the founders of BDS certainly have some anti-Semitic feelings. And while the people that are vehemently supporting BDS may not be anti-Semitic themselves, it leads to a hostile environment that where um, anti-Semitism just thrives. I don't think it's any coincidence that the BDS movement has begun to gain momentum across college campuses, and we've seen a huge uptick of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, there's an API chapter, which is a Jewish fraternity that in Emory University that had swastikas drawn all over its house in the past month. Um, students have been attacked at University of Arizona. And these, I wish I could say it was surprising, but it just keeps on coming up. And I don't think it's any coincidence. And I, th I think I, I'll go piggyback on that, um, is that I think some groups uh, who support BDS, uh, some countries too, do it out of hatred for Jews. I would say that's clear, but that's, you know, the, those are mostly its neighbors and they would support it if it's opportunistic completely. Um, well, how, how do you account for a lot of Jewish individuals and organizations supporting the BDS movement? Well, I think um, they have, they've been taught that um, in general, there's, you know, a problem in that area. There is a conflict there and Jews joining up with BDS, I think general, they have a, a, a liberal mindset, which is fine. Um, and they think that uh, in this conflict, the is Israel is oppressing the Palestinian people, and they feel that there is a, a wrongdoing going on despite their Judaism. They think that um, Israel is, uh, they, they sort of separate their Judaism from Israel, and they think Israel is doing the wrong thing in this sense. And that's fine. That's why we live in the United States. That's why if they lived in Israel, they would also have the ability to do that. It's, it's really up to them. And I think they believe that the Palestinian people are being oppressed by Israelis and by Israel based on their uh, border policies, based on their uh, view in the Knesset. Um, and so that's that's completely legitimate. And uh, I don't think it's necessarily out of anti-Semitism. Um, so that's I think that's, that would be a good explanation for why Jews might be supporting BDS. You're listening to Conrad's Corner. My name is Conrad Wilton. I'm alongside Julian Carmona and Brent Gann, two UC Davis graduate accounting students, talking about the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement against Israel and the upcoming vote put forth by the University of California Graduate Student Worker Union on December 4, asking members across the state to vote and join this movement. Last question on the merits of the movement. This is a charge that stands out from the rest, from my research at least, and that is the comparison between Israel's treatment of Palestinians to the way South Africa treated blacks under apartheid. What's your take on that? That's a completely inaccurate and false analogy. Arab citizens of Israel enjoy full rights. There are 
Arab and Muslim members of the Knesset. They served in the army, and they received the same rights as any other Israeli citizen would. To compare it to South Africa is it's appalling, and it's just a tactic used to say this is a situation where divestment was successful against a legitimate apartheid government, but to call Israel apartheid and Israeli government an apartheid state, it's full of misinformation. It's a it's a buzzword. It's a lot of a lot of pundits use buzzwords these days. When Obama was called a socialist, and and when uh, I I don't know when you use anti-Semitism directly for BDS, which I think could be used as a a, a buzzword to sort of delegitimize the movement. Well, social um, justice is a buzzword. Yes, you know these yeah, are all buzzwords. Yeah, is right. whether or not, but in this case, apartheid comes with a lot of baggage. And like Brent said, I think they're using it as a way to show that yes, the divestment from South Africa was successful, but this is not a this is not an apartheid nation at all. Like you said, the Arab uh, Arab citizens have the same rights. They serve in the Knesset. And I think there's one big thing that a lot of them bring up is that segregated housing. And I think a lot of them will take it from the view of the um, of, of their side that's that's uh, what, beneficial to them is that they think, oh, Israelis will um, segregate them like they're second class citizens. But I think a lot of devout Muslims would not want to live with non-Muslims. I think in, in some cases, including some of the uh, new uh, buildings, not the settlements, by the way, you have Arab-only housing because I don't think, and, and I don't want to speak for all Muslims, but I don't think devout Muslims would would, would want to live with non-Muslims. There's a there's a there's a cultural difference, a religious difference, and different traditions, and I think the separation is a respect to that. To say that Israel oppresses Arabs like like uh, South Africa oppressed uh, African American or Africans there is is completely off, yeah. completely off base. And we can just look at how progressive Israel is on so many issues. Women enjoy full rights. Um, homosexuals and full, enjoy full rights. Arabs enjoy full rights. I mean, to call it apartheid is just completely off base. So let's assume that the vote passes because it has gotten a lot of support in the media and also across uh, a lot of the UC schools in the recent months. What happens next? Does does anything actually occur if the vote goes through? As far as tangible effects, I don't think a lot will happen. This is a hugely symbolic vote. It calls for the divestment of the UC pension portfolio, which the UC regents have said many times won't be happening no matter how many of these divestment resolutions pass. It calls for an end of US government aid to Israel. And of course, we've seen recently that That's Israel is going to remain a support, or the US is going to remain a supporter of Israel for time to come. I mean, do, do, do the supporters of this movement, do they honestly believe that if this goes through, and of course in the aggregate, I guess that's the that's the idea, that lots of different labor unions across yeah. the country voice their support for Palestine and their condemnation of the United States for supporting Israel in the form of military aid. Is the USA going to listen to that? I mean, do they really believe that the USA would listen to that? It's It's political poison for anybody to bring up dropping support for Israel in, in Congress. And that would be where they want to go, I assume. They want to assume that we're going to take the billion plus or so dollars that we give to Israel every year. But that's that's just not going to happen. And I, I don't even think, um, I, I know I saw this in the um, the Berkeley example, that the steward of the union there didn't even have a clear answer as to what the resolution of this resolution would be. What, what, what would be the end game? And here, I'll, I'll read from this. It said, the resolution does not call for any particular sort of end state or resolution. It, so it, it seems like even from his own, you know, in his own words, it's completely symbolic. And I don't, I think like a lot of these things, they're going to pass it. They're going to pat themselves on the back and then they're, nothing's going to happen. What about the negative impact of it as well? Because interestingly, it's in addition to asking students you know, or members of the union to support the BDS movement or at least support the union's divestment against Israel, it actually asks the individual to refuse to take part in any research, conference, event, exchange program, or other activities sponsored by Israeli universities. What about that? Is that is that a good thing? I think that's <laughs> the one area where we'll see a more tangible effect on campus, yeah. is the TA union and the UC Workers Union participating in the academic boycott of Israel. And the Israeli research in so many fields, especially engineering, medicine like done by design. israeli universities yeah yeah it's it's sort of it's really short-sighted um i think what they're not looking at israel is an easy target but i think they don't emphasize like brent said the kind of life-saving innovative products that come out of um israeli universities and israeli innovation they created the cell phone they created the pentium 4 chip you know they had a um done research on a 
Ebola vaccine way before anybody else did. They have the most scientific papers per capita, and they have innovation in agriculture and energy that is solving drought problems in an area that obviously is very desert climate. You know, but we should just turn turn the other cheek on this. Yeah, well, just see, ignore that's, all of it. See, that's, that's the thing. Like, yeah. in, I'll take give you another example. In California, we have issues with the drought, and we're trying to find ways to desalinize water in order to use it um, for you know drinking for plants and, and whatnot. In Israel, it's already a foregone conclusion. They've already done that. They've already made um, scalable a uh, scalable uh, use of desalination because they need to. They just go out and do it. You see that that's very much an Israeli innovation there. And so, in order to say, well, okay, we're just going to divest completely from that source of innovation and that source of knowledge, it's completely short-sighted. I think it's it's also ridiculous being as someone who very much supports the scientific community. Last question. And and this this deals with the, the big picture because we're we're talking again about University of California Graduate Student Worker Union. And the question is whether this is worth it. We got thousands of dollars and hours expended to convince graduate students and student workers to show their support for an international issue. And what about other things like workplace conditions, class sizes, poor pay? I'll even throw in gender neutral bathrooms, even though I think they're, that's a crock. But nevertheless, why, why, why focus on this? How, how is this all of a sudden a top priority? I don't understand it. To me, it's completely outside of the scope of what the union should be focusing on. They should be focusing on the, the issues you just mentioned. And additionally, even just this past couple of days, the international leadership of the UAW, which is the United Auto Workers Union, which UAW Local 2865 falls under, sent a letter to uh, the leaders of the UC Graduate Student Workers Union reaffirming their opposition to the BDS movement. They made a statement in 2007. They said, we aggressively oppose the BDS movement. And in addition, the UAW represents so many workers of the companies that it is proposing to divest from. What about you, Juliana? Are we have we lost our focus? Oh yeah. Well, I, I completely I completely agree with Brent here. There, the whole point of the union in general is to have solidarity. Um, and I think boycotting companies, whether it's union representation, whether it's UAW, or whether it's uh, electrical workers, or whether it's ILW or whatever, it's detrimental. It's completely detrimental, and it's it's self defeating. And especially if you're going to boycott um, industries or companies that are unionized within your own union. It's almost cannibalizing yourself in that sense. I want to thank you both for coming on Conrad's Corner, and we will keep our eyes very closely upon the vote on December 4. And we are back live inside Conrad's Corner, KDVS Davis 90.3 FM. Once again, thank you, Julian and Brent, for coming on the radio show, talking about a very touchy topic, to say the least. Uh, not always easy, but... Uh, it's a good time. It's a good time to uh, to share uh, your viewpoints about this. And, and regardless of what side you may be on, we do encourage you to go out there and vote. If you're a member of the Graduate Student Worker Union December 4, let your voice be heard, whatever that may be.